and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, we've done 300 odd episodes of this podcast now. And you know, over those 300 episodes, we've, we've covered all sorts of things. Sometimes, more by luck than judgment, we end up um, covering a, a, a series around the same sort of topics. Mm. Now, by and large, we cover a lot of things. But now, increasingly, we seem to have people coming along onto the show that are either selling to the affluent or are looking for people with resources to invest in their product. And now, it's worth us stepping aside and thinking all about that subject of, of doing business with the affluent. And targeting a series of podcasts around that topic yeah no i agree uh, well it as um listeners may know that uh, my business is called finally fettled and and effectively i market to the affluent and people come to me in my door and they basically say can we do that now um with your skills of course then it's it's all about you know business and um you know the, the sort of the accounting side of things and, and effectively uh, change and all that kind of stuff. And that kind of complements what I do. Um, I'm very much campaign driven and um, people come to me with, um, with, with stories of why they want to speak to people all the time. Um, you know, and effectively a lot of it is to raise money uh, because they're looking for investors. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, effectively attracting people to, a high value service that only certain types of customers um, um, would be more inclined to 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 invest or, or purchase, and we've had a few of those people um, on the podcast uh, previously. People selling um, caviar or uh, or um, high end um, vodka. A couple of people come to mind there, um, but the. The whole idea of actually orientating the next 100 days for at least a season, um, and frankly, when it comes to a season on podcasting, it, it can be anything from, you know, half a dozen episodes to, you know, 60 episodes, who knows? But I mean, I think the important thing is that we um, are finding more people who are interested in that uh, side of uh, matter. So they want to find people who are uh, who want to promote their products to people who are affluent now if you were uh, if you have a business and you're listening to this and you are looking for people not necessarily to invest in your company or in your future company um then um you know if and you're not dealing uh, with the affluent um with your service then that's probably not for certain, but probably not the best um, strategy that you could adopt. As people who are afflu affluent have far more uh, disposable disposable income, um, and and truthfully, they they make longer, better customers. Indeed, and Graham, you know, your your business finally fettled is in the marketing area you're 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 looking at marketing to the affluent and specifically you're looking at direct marketing your right. your expertise is in direct mail principally yeah, yeah now, that's right we've looked quite often at how do you market to this particular group of people but you know, the, there's far more about it than just that um mm -hmm. we've actually got a podcast coming up next week where mm -hmm. we're talking to um a very interesting organization in the in the building industry building af affordable homes and they're looking for investment at the moment mm -hmm. but we talk quite a lot about the business plan that that company's got yeah why it's important to have a solid business plan when you're going forward looking for investors why you need to have identified the stages of growth your organization's going through why you need to have identified all the risks in that business plan yeah um that same person touched on not just direct mail but started talking about oh we're about to, about to begin social media campaign to look yeah. to get these investors in so no yeah. there are just so many aspects of business that you need to get right, focusing on, on this particular market segment that 
there's a there's a lot of material I think we can cover. There is. Um, I, let's face it. I, my sort of ideal um, client um, tends to be at the beginning of a journey. I'm saying an ideal client, but I mean, it, 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 I can I have a number of seg- segments that I can work with. But basically, typically, a number of people come and knock on my door because basically they have a business plan. They have a they have a um, or at least a plan to raise um, uh, funding in the t- case of the um, the podcast next week. Um, the the whole plan is it's, it's they're building a pre IPO offer and they need um, investments um, of up to 10 million pounds, not individual investments, but the collective investment would be 10 million pounds with the, with, with the, uh, the, the, the smallest investment, 15,000. Now there are a lot of attractive things about that particular purport, uh, particular thing that they'll talk about next week. But basically the important thing is that they start with having built a business and an idea and a, and, and, and a very good business. The issue then is how do you go about attracting people to you um, to invest in, in, in your business? Because let's face it, whether you're, you know, high net worth, uh, affluent, um, ultra high net worth, you know, effectively you're a person and people are often um, bothered about, about, you know, things like scams and so forth and so on. And they, they want to make sure that they uh, are investing in things that are, that are solid, that are likely to provide a return. So the key thing is our podcast isn't really about providing financial advice. It's, it's bringing your attention to some of these people who are looking for investors. And, you know, all we're doing is sort of pointing a signpost if you're interested. And the, the key thing with all of these things is if we have um, a company on who are looking for investment, then it's not Kevin and Graham saying that, um, you know, you, you know, you should do it because we might be interested. Uh, and as it happens, you know, I am interested in uh, the, the uh, proposal for that, that, that we'll talk about next week. But from your point of view, if you basically are, are enticed if you like or uh, you're, you're intrigued by by the discussion then it's on you to go and find out more information so you can make a, um, a, a sensible um, call in terms of investment now part of that diligence or due diligence as people call it is is actually talking to your financial advisors but doing that kind of extra bit of research asking yourself a question about you know, well, what are, what's, what are the risks here? What are the upsides? Oh, yeah, that upside sounds pretty high. But what are the risks? Of it's not going to come about. And, you know, on the podcast, what we did, um, and you'll find out next week, is that we asked those questions. So we kind of help in, but it's not the top and bottom of it. You have to do other things. So I guess in a way, Kevin, by focusing on these areas, um, we're not just talking about marketing. We are talking about um, risk. We're talking about, you know, financial matters and understanding why um, and, and how a business is being put together and how a, a business is likely to operate. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, all we're doing is asking questions. Yeah. And, Graham, I think for what we're doing in the forthcoming season, there are effectively two audiences. Mm. Um, you might be one of those affluent people that are interested in alternatives and having your eyes open to where you can invest or interesting products to buy and so on and so forth. But you may equally be a business or a, an entrepreneur looking to either sell to or looking for that investment from affluent individuals. And we're trying to cover across the series lots of lessons for you in terms of firstly um we'll have guests like the guest we had last week dave plunkett where we were talking about partnerships Mm. and how partnerships could help businesses targeting that this particular segment we'll have other sessions like that we we know from the the conversation we're going to bring you next week that social media will be part of their strategy so we want to go back and probably revisit in one of these episodes social media, but particularly targeted at 
the more affluent segment. Yeah, I, I'm kind of. Um, um, we've had conversations in the past on different podcasts, so with different people, with some very gifted individuals, and and I'm I'm yet to be completely convinced about um, about social media when it comes to the um, high net worth and the ultra high net worth. I'm sure they exist there. How easy it is to target and actually persuade them through social media, don't know. It should be, logically, it should be a media that works for you. So it's not, you should not ignore it. And we certainly would want to explore it as part of the next 100 days. But one of the things that I, I want to be persuaded on is, is just how effective can it be? Is it that I'm following a, a shiny object or, or shall we say an object that's uh, once had a huge amount of shine on it? And now it's um, losing perhaps a little bit of luster. But having said that, if it works, it works. So, you know, you, but, it, but would you exclude other media um, that, um, you know, also work? I think the, the thing is when it comes to targeting and marketing to the, to the affluent, um, you know, it, there are no right and wrong media one of the things that um you know if, if you think of marketing um as uh, three points of a triangle then you have your market now let's just say you're looking for somebody who is an investor a high net worth investor we'll come back to that in a minute but a high net worth investor uh where do they live well actually um i'm thinking ahead and i'd really like to meet them so let's do it within say 75 miles radius of london which more or less is the whole of the southeast and you know a little bit of the midlands or south midlands and out towards oxford and that kind of thing so that's that's the catchment very very in fact the most wealthy uh, region of the country um and so within that um can we identify an audience that might be interesting now i have um a chap uh, contacted me at the moment who spoke to me a couple of days ago who who's in the whiskey market now um as it happens i'm partial to the odd uh, uh dram so basically um um you know quite interested in, in what he's got to do now his so so we've got the market we've got the proposition or, or shall we say the um uh, the message now in that message to market his his again is looking for investors in whiskey now whiskey can be um it's you know it's a very very strong alternative investment and you know buying the right whiskey holding it and so forth and then selling it at a later date um often you don't really drink it but you but you effectively store it in in bond and watch watch the um, the, the the value of it go up particularly for whiskies that are rare um so that i think yeah is, Graham, is the, i remember just just a couple well immediately before lockdown did a distillery yeah. tour over oh yeah new year break in scotland yeah, and yeah. we we did a, a little bit extra we went up for a private tasting in yeah. one of the rooms and yeah. we got to sample a tiny bit of a very expensive whiskey yeah the thing that the trick here seems to be manage to invest in a whiskey where the distillery is just about to go out of business Mm. they well, seem to be worth a fortune i don't know about that but um it, it, if it's if it's um i mean there are certain markets and, and and they're not all here in the uk i mean um there are markets out in the far east who absolutely love our whiskey and our scottish whiskey and um you know so from from that point of view so there's a but there's a message to that market so how do you go about uh, presenting that message to those high net worth individuals on the, with a view to actually bringing them closer to you so you can have conversations about investing or, or whatever it, it is that you want to do, whether it might be buying a high-end hi-fi system that is going to cost you 20,000 quid. Now, the regular guy is not necessarily going to invest in that, but a high net worth individual might say, this is fantastic, exactly what I want, and, and I'll have that conversation. And then now, the other, Graham, the, the other part of the... for a moment here. Hmm. Now, we're clearly talking about a, a whole group of people when we talk about affluent yeah. that can that you're gonna to have to be very careful with as you as you look at how you approach because you've got a you've got a niche down quite considerably. Yeah. You know? Um you've already 
mentioned one particular niche in there that's a subset of affluent individuals. And you're talking about high net worth individuals. Can you explain exactly what a high net worth individual is and what's the significance of that? It, it, well, it's very significant because it, it's, it's um, people who are seeking investors are obligated to present their offers to people who are uh, nom- well, who are high net worth in, uh, in investors. So high net worth just means that you have £250,000 worth of effectively di- disposable assets. Now that may, you know, that's, those are assets that, that you actually own, that might be ISAs and so forth, and various other things that you have in your portfolio beyond the value of the property you live in. So in other words, you don't include the value of your house. Let's just say that your house is worth you know, £500,000 that in and of itself is not included in the the um, evaluation of you as a high net worth in, investor. Where you have other assets that aggregate to a quarter of a million pounds or more, and obviously it's a, it's like a scale, quarter of a million pounds gets you through to the it's table stakes, it gets you onto the table. But, you know, many people have millions and millions of, 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 um, of assets that they've grown through businesses and all kinds of other um, ways that they've actually um, uh, found that money. So that it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sort of a minimum limit. The issue then becomes, how do you find those people? But that's another story, maybe for another day, but, the, but at least it defines the audience. But not not everybody that's affluent is necessarily high net worth. You, no, you, they're not. You can have income, a fairly large amount of disposable income, and therefore mm. still be interested in certain things. Now, yeah. not, not every investment is restricted just to high net worth individuals, is it, Graham? No, no, it isn't. And and um, um, I've um, one of our future guests. Um, um, I'll be quite discreet because. Um, I'm, I'm actually under NDA, so effectively, um, it is um, a sporting venue, and um, they are looking for affluent and high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals to to get involved. I'll say no more than that. But effectively, um, the, the the point is, it is the actual um, offer isn't financially restricted. So from that point of view, an affluent individual can apply now the what what does that mean now it, it's it, it's a bit like where do you start where you finish is is clear because i've just talked about high net worth at a quarter of a million pounds worth of assets an affluent individual will have less than that now they might have let's just say it's, it's a con- convenient sort of level and for many um, independent financial advisors for instance they don't really want to deal with you unless you've got more than sort of 50,000 or that kind of level. Some will do less, but you know, it's, they, that's, that's how they'll look at it. So if, even if you've got something like, let's just say at the lowest end, so 30,000 pounds worth of assets all the way through to a quarter of a million, though that will define you as affluent. Now you pointed out something else there, Kevin, which is that sometimes people have very high, very high incomes, and often people come to me and say, "Well, I, I want people with you know 150,000 pounds or more uh, of annual income." Now the problem with that is actually identifying people with those incomes because the the data isn't always available to describe people in those ways. So we use other ways of doing that, but the but yes, you are right. There are people who might be earning a hundred thousand pounds per annum, and um, but their overall, shall we say, assets that maybe they're very high, highly leveraged. They've got mortgages and all kinds of other things. So that hundred thousand is whittled away. You know, a hundred thousand is what well, I don't know seven seven thousand five hundred quid a, a year a, a month rather. Um, and by the time they've paid the mortgage and various other bills, etc., ain't an awful lot left. Absolutely. But now we're talking on one hand about how how do you as a business that may be looking for an investor or as a provider of product that might be looking for an investor, such as whiskey, mm. um, you're looking at particularly those people that are, are looking to invest a, a look of money. But equally, 
yeah, doing yeah. business with the affluent, you, you can be selling products. And yeah. the the other side of this is that you know, individuals with reasonable amounts of disposable income tend to have interests, hobbies, and so on, that, that they'll spend a lot of money on. You know? mm. you, you, you've you talked about sporting venues very briefly, which I'm sure we'll go into more detail on the later episode when you're allowed to. Mm. Um, but, you know, a lot of my friends are very keen golfers. If you've got some disposable income, well, you're, you're probably going to spend money on a, a rather more than average set of golf clubs absolutely yeah yeah so now you're by and large you're talking about a community that you've got to niche down on particularly well yeah. because now take take that example you're you're looking for golfers yeah but you're looking for not just the average golfer you're looking for somebody who's rather keen on improving their game and also can afford to spend a little bit more in terms of the equipment and the skills to do it. So one of the things that we're going to be exploring in, the, in this series is, is you know, how do you build your avatar? Because yeah. the, 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 the markets for some of the things that we're talking about are relatively small. And there's a potential that you can waste an awful lot of money mm. marketing or trying to sell to the wrong people. I am. Um was approached a couple of days ago with um, um, uh, a very um, um, smart uh, uh, young lady who basically was working on behalf of a company who had developed a golf app. Um, They kind of benefited quite considerably from lockdown um, and um, writing things down on a piece of paper and so forth uh, became um, less less um attractive i don't know why but nonetheless uh, that was the not that um that was a, a less attractive way of actually recording your scores etc but as we you wander around the golf course um and i when i play i genuinely do wander around uh, from side to side um uh, not not intentionally of course um but the app would you know track all of that and 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 help you sort of understand more or less where you're going wrong. Uh, and of course, the answer... Ruth Graham, it would need a, a bigger database than comes on the average mobile phone to track where you're going wrong. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it was, it, it was probably going to be, it'll be a big sign that they'll come up at the end of the app and say something like, you know, you went wrong by turning up at the golf cor- uh, the, the golf club. But I think the truth, of, uh, the truth of it is, is that the app itself, I took a look at it and it looks fantastic. It, it really has so many aspects to it from booking booking your course to you know just looking at the way in which you're you're hitting the ball and all that kind of stuff so effectively um stuff that you can't get down on a piece of paper you know the fact that you took seven shots or five shots or three shots or whatever on a particular hole that's one thing but how did that all happen you know so a really interesting product and again they're looking for investors now and when, there's, there's um, another side to this graham that, that's talking mm. about affluence as well yep. Lots of people are coming along with the idea of a high-tech company, mm. and I'm dealing with folk every day and CFOs of the sorts of company you're describing there. Yeah, and th- there's a journey there that's that's about set the company up, get the investment, whether it's through um, angel investors, high net worth individuals, a series A, a series B, whatever it is you go through in that process. But Mm. the idea is ultimately to sell the company and probably sell the company for for quite a bit of money and become affluent. And we we had a podcast all about that journey a few weeks ago. Um, But there are those individuals as well that we ought to be thinking about that are in the process of becoming affluent yeah yeah well yes no well they're they're they're, um um yes i mean the the thing is about the affluent is that you can probably see them on the way up um and it's a it's whether 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 or not you want to uh, build a relationship with them a very very strong relationship which means that when they get more affluent they stay and spend and are loyal to you so, I mean, it, 
that's quite an interesting move. And maybe profitability is limited initially, but over the long term, not so much. I mean, you you'd be benefiting considerably. Take, for instance, financial advisors who basically get you at you know uh, an early stage. You stay with them for twenty years, and they've just yeah, made I've a huge value amount of considerable. Money. Yeah. And, you, and, and I, I'm, I'm dealing every day, Graham, with finance directors and CFOs. Yeah. And mm. you know, I'm selling relatively high value mentoring type products to those mm. individuals. Yeah. And there's an interesting take on this that, you know, your affluent individual or the individual that will commit a lot of money, there's also the case that they're committing their companies or their businesses money rather yes. than their own. Yes. Um, you know, most of our mentoring clients are probably being funded by their business, but you're still selling to the individual who has the same characteristics as an affluent individual. Uh, yes, very much. And, and um, you, you're, you're, you're definitely selling to the lifestyle, to the aspirations, to the, to the way that they like to do things, to the events that they like to go to, um, to, you know, the experiences uh, they like to have. And those are the sorts of things that um, I'm sure will come up in the series because, you know, the truth is many people are effectively so well off that it's not necessarily about making, a, you know, a book here and a book there. So it's, it's very much about enjoying the life that their wealth enables them to have. And, and so, you know, that might mean that they're buying particular things that, um, you know, bring them pleasure and bring them, um, you know, an experience that they can look back on their lives and say, yeah, we did that. Um, you know, and I think that's the understanding the motivations. Um, I mean, one of the things that is is challenging, I think, for most marketers is understanding that three prong triangle. And we did two of them earlier and the third one is media. And it's, if you can understand those three things, then it will make it easier for you to communicate effectively with high net worth individuals. Um, so the target market, high net worth uh, individuals, uh, the offer and the message, how are you going to write, what you're going to say, how you're going to, um, and I'm going to expand on that in a second, but how are you going to say and write your offer to them? And then the medium or the media that you use to actually do that. And that's where your social media comes in. And that's where direct mail or, or uh, uh, newspaper um, uh, uh, advertising, whatever it is that you choose to do, it might even be radio, what might not be as well. But the point is it, it's that type of thing that you would choose to um, have that kind of conversation with the people that you're trying to get that to. So the, the, the thing that I want to bring out of this is, is that often the conversation I have with my clients is that what do you want them to do? next and if they can if they can envisage the type of thing that they would really like their um, um uh, interested affluent individual to do next then that will really help them and often and this is where it comes down to uh understanding that everybody you know the it doesn't matter which market whether they're affluent or not markets are not all ready to buy now never they'll never will be ever some are ready, some are itching to get going, and there are others who, we, who want more information before they commit. And I think if you see it as two blocks of people, those who are ready and those who are not quite ready, then those are the main blocks that you're looking for. There is another block, and that other block is those people who will never be ready, and those people who are never going to be ready are never going to be your audience, and they're never going to be your ideal audience, and they're never going to buy from you. But the other two, you've got a really good chance, the ones who are ready now. So you have to have a, an idea of how you're going to have a conversation with them, and then the ones who are going to be ready soon. And there's some clever things you can do with that. And that's often about making almost like making friends with people what would you actually do to make friends or to to shall we say win some sort of influence with somebody and i think there are all kinds of things that you know we can explore on this podcast that you can do that would actually help you build almost like a list of people who are not quite ready but going to be ready in the next few months and looking at that angle of, of the business isn't the only thing to consider here um 
And I think what, why we're going to make this a great series of episodes, Graham, is that you can bring the, the marketing and sales mm. aspect to this, and yeah. I can bring the finance aspects to this, yeah. um, as well as having that marketing plan, that long-term plan of creating relationships and so on. You also need a solid business plan in other yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, we're, we're probably going to explore customer service yeah. with these individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're dealing with a person who's potentially spent a lot of money with you. Yeah. Now, besides the sale in the first place, your support after that has to be first rate. Mm. Now, everything that you put into the structure of your business has to be solid. Mm. You've got to have a great strategy in place, a great business plan to build all of those things, particularly if you're growing a business. You know? If you're growing very quickly, and you don't put all of the support functions in place. Yeah. And you're going to fall over incredibly quickly. You, 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 are. you, you It takes a lot of effort to win a client. But it okay. doesn't take very much to go wrong to lose a client. Yeah, absolutely. That's that. That's ap- that certainly been my experience. And, and I know it's been your experience with um, a high-end car. Absolutely. Well, uh, I probably won't mention the the particular brand, but uh, well, you, probably... didn't you say it was Jaguar? Um, I might have done. Yeah, but to put it this way, Graham. After my experience with current Jaguar, I wouldn't buy another Jaguar Land Rover product. Which is a real sadness, because to be honest with you, they're, they're you know they they can be brilliant cars, and so there's you know the, but the end of the day where they kind of let you down was probably in the after sales market it, you know you bought the car is running then it didn't run yeah and the first three months i had the current car the the dealer had the car more than i did wow um not a good story and and you know the, the probably the best and clearest way for a, a big brand to deal with that is to say give me that back you're going to get a new one and and um um on a, on a much lower scale i mean that's what iPhones do. They don't. They don't fix an iPhone anymore. Anymore. You have a problem with an iPhone. They just send you a new one. Absolutely. So, and there's a an example there from from a company Apple. Who, you no, know, Apple's reputation isn't really based on great products. It's as much based on a, a great overall experience for the customer. I I certainly attest to that. I mean, they're, they're, when you have problems, um, and I've had. You know the occasional glitches, probably self-inflicted, but nonetheless, they're so gracious, and um, their customer services are. I really think they're second to none. But they, um, they don't treat you like don't treat you like an idiot, and nobody wants to be treated like an idiot. But the fact is, relative to their knowledge, you know, you're on the idiot sc- scale, aren't you? You just don't know what to do next. But you kind of have got to a situation where you need help. What you don't need is somebody to patronise you. What you don't need is somebody to uh, get all ruly with you and that you can't get out of that situation. What you do need is, is somebody who's going to take action and make things better for you. Um, and particularly when you look at um, an affluent individual who potentially could have bought, I don't know, Kevin, you're not that old, but I mean, let's say you could have easily bought another three or four of their cars at their staggeringly high price of around, what, 50, 60,000 quid for the next, you know, t- uh, 10 years. Oh, and, you easily, know, easily. And, and, and they're, that, they're not that actually gone. that staggeringly unaffordable because uh, you look at the PCPs on them yeah, and the PCPs aren't significantly more than some of the most much lesser brands around. But we're now making the case for understanding the affluent lifetime value, which is which should be part of your business model. We should be, we should be part of the way in which you're looking at every acquired customer, because losing that has a huge amount of future bank money. Absolutely, Graham. And if and you that you, then, you, I mean, you, you look at the business and. Now, there, you're, you're trying to create a business, possibly with that exit in mind, mm. or potentially selling to the particular type of customer that we've just spoken to. Yeah. Now, the valuation of your business at the end of three or five years when you're going to sell it isn't just based on the, the volume of sales. No? Yeah, it, A lot of it is based on reputation. A lot of it is based on repeat revenue. Yeah. 
there are there are many character characteristics of a business valuation to think about. And actually, that that would make quite an interesting episode in itself. As we as we the, the, the thing is this particular group of people. Our podcast has been, you know, Catholic in its understanding. In sense, it's a, a, a wide range of subjects. Um, we're not um, we're not wedded to simply planning, as in the next hundred days. You know, what can you get done and all that kind of thing. Um, it's very much about all points, almost everywhere in a business context, and sometimes that's headspace, relationships with other people, how you communicate. Um, all of that is relevant to the affluent. Um, in addition to that, it's obviously about marketing. It's obviously about um, you know techniques that you can use in with with social media or whatever else it is. Um, it's also about the way in which your business is is, is put together, um, and you know business plan. Uh, but you know all these subjects. If we start putting together a series of of podcasts, which you know, cover these subjects, but from different people's perspectives. You know, let's just say that the, the the whiskey guy came on. Now he's, you know, it's it's not just about investors. There are other things that he will have done and do and does do to make sure that his clients are happy, stay with him for a long time, refer him, all kinds of other things that go on in a business now it would be interesting to find that out and then our audience we hope that what what we do is we bring enough people into the podcast that you can actually start saying oh, i get that i can do that or i'm not doing that and maybe i should where do i go to find help and i think that is and, and sometimes it will be a straight by the way this is something that you might want to consider for your pocket you know, do some research, etc. It sounds like it's a good thing, um, but sometimes those stories are quite interesting in and of themselves. So it's it's just you know we'll bring those sort of things as well. But yes, Graham, it, this this does boil down to the next hundred days. It's yeah. really if if you, if we if you're an investor and you're listening to the sorts of things we're talking about, it's relevant if you've got a sum of cash around that you need to invest in the next hundred days. If you don't have that sum of cash around. It's kind of a, a so what if you're a business looking to deal with the type of audience we're talking about, mm -hmm. then, you know, you want to do something different. We're, we're tr going to try and be practical and say, if you want to do something different in this area, here's what you can do in the next hundred days. You know? yeah. Yeah. Remember, well, I mean, I... Do you remember Felix Verardi that came on and talked mm, about strategy? Yes. Now, Felix told us all about his trip in the Himalayas, moving up between various base camps and, and so on, and then brought over this concept. Well, if you're going to do a three to five year business plan, if you're going to double or triple your business in three years, then actually you break it down into 90 or 100 day chunks. Yeah. Absolutely. What can you do in the next 90 days? And even then he was splitting that down into 30 days and said, OK, you get your team in the first 30 days. To, to do the discovery piece. Mm. You do you, the next 30 days, they do some design based on what they've discovered. In the yeah. next 30 days, you implement. Do that, move on to the next thing on your route map. I, and all of that is relevant to, to mar uh, marketing or, or doing business with the affluent. So from, from, from that point of view, what we, what we hope to do is to bring you interesting guests as always, but with a potential, with a slant towards um, doing business in this particular way and you know it's quite universal it's not like oh that's not going to be for me then because we, we're not here talking about social work are we let's face it I mean at the end of the day we are that's not our podcast we are a business orientated podcast uh, we do like to have a bit of fun Kevin at the end of the day it's not just about business we have we yeah, have and fun then we can we can play at least one of our football clubs has been successful in managing to get <laughs> itself owned by some affluent people uh, yeah well that's that's probably true um but um, um and they could yeah, be interesting yeah. guests on the podcast Greg. yeah well if you can get them kevin you know, you've got you i mean you've got uh, you've got um uh, links in riyadh didn't you because we, we did a number of podcasts mm -hmm. from riyadh didn't we we did yes so i'm yeah. sure you'll know somebody who knows somebody 
I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, um, uh, football is concerned, it's one of the, yeah, I mean, you know, take football as a product. I mean, does it, you know, is it marketed to the affluent? Well, have a look at, look at the boxes. You know, who owns those? Well, often corporates. Well, who own, you know, effectively, who in the corporates actually has committed? Well, obviously a fan of the relevant football uh, team, um, but often with a big say in a company. So the chances are they're actually marketing to the affluent just perhaps just through the auspices of, of, of companies. Now, you know, um, often uh, people take guests to, to football matches and, and go through hospitality. Again, that's another similar market, but you're often not just looking for wealth per se, but wealth plus an interest. And that's where we go into Dave D's um, sort of uh, psychographics or, or lifestyle interests, you know, and effectively it's not just about demographics, it's about psychographics and what are their interests and, and, and what basically gets them out of bed. And, and for you, Kevin, it's sadly um, Newcastle United. Um, but, um, you know, um, we can't do much about that, really. Um, but having well, Graham, said that, as we as we record this, you're, you're still in that precarious position of, uh, of um, one match left. You need another club to, to lose two matches in order to stay in the Premier League. And of course, listeners, by the time you're listening to this, we'll know the, the, the complete outcome of this. Yeah, we will. And, and look, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll state for the, for the, for the tape, um, I am personally uh, agnostic about going up or uh, staying up or, or going down. I really am. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the years under Marcelo Bielsa, at least, in the Championship, where we saw some scintillating football. Um, and, and then he brought it into the, the Premier League for a year. And this year we struggled. Um, there's no question about that. And there's lots of reasons for that. But the the, the fact is, um, if you're a f if you are interested in football and you take it too seriously, then you've kind of missed the point. I think the, at the end of the day, that it, it's it's still a game. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd like us to do well. I'd like us to stay in the Premier League. But having said that, I'm not going to be crying into my soup if we go down. It's going to be my season tickets already bought. So if they're down, that's what that's what I'll be served up next year. And so, I'll so being an affluent person, Graham, I know that one of the, the key things about the affluent is that why 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 they like nice things, they aren't half keen on value for money as well. Mm. So if there's a mm. relegation, are you going to be asking for some money back? No, no, not at all. No, no, <laughs> I, no, no. I think the um the the, the thing that I can't bring myself to be the kind of person that says it's somebody else's fault. If if I make a mistake, it's mine. You know, it's my mistake. I can't bring myself to say, no, it's that person's mistake. Um, it's so easy to do that. And it's almost human to do that. But actually, um, running a business like you do um, uh, and, and having run a business for a few years now, the book stops here. Yeah. You know, you make and, a bad you know, move, Graham, then it's your bad move. Uh, there's a man that you quote quite often, your superhero. In Dan business. Kennedy. It might be Dan Kennedy. Yeah. Dan wrote a book called Renegade Millionaire. He did. Now, mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting, putting those two words together. Mm -hmm. And it says that anybody that's up there at the millionaire level yeah. or wants to approach that level either is or is becoming a renegade in some mm. way. Mm. They're operating in a different way to the masses. As Dan makes a point very quickly in that book that actually you know, the bottom 20% of the population mm. are pretty much bankrupt. Yeah. The next 60% are absolutely struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And it's only the top 20% that are actually comfortable and only the top 5% that could be called something vaguely coming towards affluent. Now, I, I'm that sure says five we'll percent, which is that the twenty. If you took in the eighty twenty rule, yeah. you know, it's you're in the twenty percent, and then you're taking twenty percent of the twenty percent. Yeah. Now they be folks that get into that place behave in a different way, and yeah. just exploring that word renegade to me is possibly going to be a fascinating episode or two. Yes. No. I. I. I well. Um, hopefully, um, if the season's still going 
on the other side of September, I'll be able to uh, bring back some personal memories of, uh, uh, of, of being in the same room as Mr. Kennedy. So um, uh, I, I have uh, planned uh, to go to Orlando in uh, September to, to listen to Dan Kennedy as a longtime gold member of 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 his organization so basically um hopefully i'll bring back some 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 nuggets from from that uh, session so um today it's been um uh, a, a looking forward podcast that we're laying out the future yeah, i'm of, thoroughly you know, thoroughly looking forward to doing yeah. the, this this season of episodes and who knows where it goes to it might yeah be we don't know season. but um it's it should be interesting and we hope you stick with us and uh, and get some value out of the people that we're going to bring along so Today, well, I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye.